words from me at this moment, what I'll do is I'll invite um, my co-panelists to speak and uh, we will have a discussion after that. So why don't we start with uh, Julia? So we, we uh, had a quick discussion just before we started and decided maybe we go alphabetically. And so it's Julia who will be speaking first. Julia, may I invite you to share your journey with us, please? Okay, um, can you, yeah, here we are. So thank you so much, first of all, for Kamia and everybody for uh, this invitation. It's really a great pleasure to present today um, with um, professionals uh, whose work I really admire. So um, my name is Julia Bini, I'm curator and producer at the EPFL Pavilions at the Swiss Federal Institute for Technology in Lausanne. And, um, just so EPFL Pavilions is located at the heart of an international uh, campus and university and in participation with diverse communities of the, uh, the EPFL, uh, we are an experimental space for access to new forms of knowledge arising at the intersection of transdisciplinary practices and in this sense, of course, the uh, wide uh, scenario, scientific scenario at the EPFL. So since 2017, APFL Pavilions is directed by Professor Sarah Kenderden, and I joined Professor Sarah Kenderden at the end of 2017, after three years at the ZKM Karlsruhe Center for Arts and Media. So uh, I invite you to um, uh, observe, I'm sorry because I'm, I, I cannot really go through my slides easily. One second. Okay, here we are. Um, so uh, today I wanted to discuss with you uh, nature of robotics in expanded field, which was in the, this, exhibi this exhibition, which focused on uh, robotics. And the aim was to frame robotics into environment related thinking. Nature of robotics uh, intended to offer an unusual take on the topic of robotics through an intertwined narration of the, between the nature world environment, ecology, and technology inviting contemporary artists on the place, uh, on, let's say, reflecting on the place of artificial agents in our natural and social ecosystem. Borrowing Rosalind Krauss' notion of expanded field of sculpture, the exhibition uh, delineated, we could say, a trajectory um, through contemporary artistic practices, but also establishing a platform of discussion between scientific um, research at EPFL and uh, contemporary artists. So among the featured artists, for instance, Jean Tangli, Urs Fischer, Basim Magdi, Agnes Denes, Suzanne Treister, Kade Novitskova, Alexander Desi Ginsburg, Trevor Peglen, and also site-specific productions such as um, a work by uh, Melissa Dabin and Aaron Davidson and Asib Hamed. So as you can see here in this picture, we had a sort of uh, display of scientific work uh, produced by um, uh, the EPFL, uh, so the EPFL professors and scientists, uh, and uh, which were uh, which was in dialogue, let's say, with uh, with contemporary artists. So vision emerging from laboratories are just opposed with uh, speculative creatures, drawings and diagrams and videos by contemporary artists. And uh, here, yeah, the visual philosophy by Agnes Dennis and the reconfigurable robotics by uh, Professor Jimmy Pike were sort of uh, in discussion in the exhibition space. Uh, and of course, also the work by Katya Novitskova, for instance, the installation pattern of activity was in this case fed with scientific imaging from uh, the EPFL labs. Um, this specific um, project uh, that was a specific production in the framework of the show and in the framework also of an artist in residence program we are establishing at the EPFL. Uh, so artist Melissa Dabin and Aaron Davidson working in collaboration with the Biorobotics Laboratory at the EPFL. In this case, uh, Dabin and Davidson knowledge in the field of uh, robotics was sort of enriched by data um, by the biorobotics lab at the EPFL. And um, the visualization here, basically you see the different steps. So the laboratory worked in, uh, let's say, studying the, the, the behavior of this soft, uh, of this manta ray in a water environment. So we have here the scientific data, which were then uh, sort of acquired and implemented by the artists in this visualization, which was presented in the exhibition space. And to return also, of course, on this idea of uh, establishing and fostering collaborations between artists and scientists, uh, the um, 
we launched uh, this year the first, let's say, comprehensive edition of the APFL uh, College of Humanities Artists in Residency program. So we have a story in the sense that we already welcomed artists at the APFL to work in collaboration with uh, professors and scientists. This is the exhibition uh, Babylonian Vision by artist Nora Albadri, which was developed in the framework of such a collaboration and, of course, it expands on the colonial and machine learning museum practices by generating what she names emancipatory techno heritage. But let's say for this first comprehensive edition, I'm responsible for starting from this year at the APFL, uh, the, under the title Enter the Arper Scientific, we uh, sort of invited an international community of, of artists to basically enter the APFL. And, uh, and of course, our aim, uh, so this program is uh, directed, it's, let's say, initiated by the APFL um, College of Humanities direction, and it's amplified by APFL pavilions. And it, the aim is to forge uh, encounters between artists and scientists in different disciplines, and to establish, of course, a dynamic platform for, uh, let's say, propelling new approaches and aesthetic investigations within the uh, scenario that we know is exponentially developing at the intersection of art science, uh, technology, and the humanities. Uh, we uh, had four directions for this year, so open transdisciplinary wearable technologies, interface design and digital animation, and scientific imaging, and also to, let's say, link this light uh, to, to my, let's say, own path. Of course, Enter the Iceberg Scientific was also my, my really impression when I arrived at the EPFL of course, really entering the, the, the wide variety of uh, multidisciplinary uh, directions in science. Just shortly to uh, conclude rapidly, if I have two minutes, my uh, presentation, it's basically my current curatorial um, work uh, uh, builds uh, upon a, a number of projects I worked on at the Zakan Kazu, where I was part of the curatorial team from 2014 to 2017 projects that basically um, reflected on the on teams surrounding the techno scientific development and a debate. So uh, hybrid layers was this uh, exhibition I co-curated, of course, with the team, which uh, was on, a, let's say, a generation of artists engaging on the growing presence of the digital. Uh, and of course, uh, we basically uh, analyzed a bit the, the generation emerging at the time, this was 2017, which was uh, deeply influenced by the digital realm. Extra Evolution was a major project initiated by Peter, Peter Weibel, the director of the ZAPAM, uh, focusing in a sense uh, on new technologies and, of course, also a scenario shaped by 3D printers and robots, cyborgs and chimeras, but also new discoveries in space research, molecular biology, neurology, and genetics. And to conclude, Spatial Affairs, this is a project I co curated this year with Lydia Lalasco Rosas, who's also the initiator of Beyond Matter, Cultural Heritage on the Verge of Virtual Reality. We worked uh, on an exhibition basically which aims at analyzing, let's say, uh, the genealogy of computational and uh, virtual space even before the arrival basically of uh, the computer. So we had a physical exhibition at the Ludwig Museum and in parallel we worked also on a digital environment under the title uh, Spatial Affairs Wording. Uh, which uh, was, uh, let's say, a virtual multi-user exhibition populated by uh, avatars of artworks in which also the visitor's avatar coexists with moving uh, bodies of internet art and browser-based projects. And this was a co-production between ZCAM and APF um, APFL Pavilions. Designed by Verodina, uh, a, a design studio from the Netherlands, and we exactly we worked on this avatar of different uh, works. So this is George the uh, Untitled Games and Rafael Rosenthal near next, one of the two examples among the 12 avatars presented in this environment. And with this, I leave uh, the, the rest to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia, for that insight into your work. Uh, Honor, may I invite you to speak next, please? Certainly. Well, firstly, um, uh, very good evening to everybody. Uh, can I just check if you can see my screen? Yes, yes excellent. And I can see you too, which is fabulous. Well, look, it, it, it's really great to be here with all of you. So I'd like to 
uh, sincerely thank uh, Kenya for the invitation and also for organizing this gathering. Um, I'm going to give a, a really quick talk that introduces a couple of projects that speak to my passions um, as a woman leader working within art, science and technology. Um, so I'm the Vice President for Attractions at Marina Bay Sands in Singapore, which you can see here. And in that capacity, I direct Art Science Museum, which is this place. So I'm going to focus mainly on the work of Art Science Museum as our mission, I think, is most relevant to uh, today's topic. I'm going to draw on some examples of work that we've produced at Art Science Museum, which respond to environmental challenges. Um, so I'll start just by saying a few words about who we are. At Art Science Museum, we are all about exploring the intersection between art, science, culture and technology. We believe it's in that space of connectivity um, that we see new ideas and innovation emerge. We uh, create exhibitions that feature some of the most well-known artists working with scientific concepts, including people like Leonardo da Vinci and MC Escher. We also stage shows that explore aspects of science and technology, such as natural history, quantum mechanics and particle physics, medical science and space exploration. But our ethos and mission, I think, is best expressed in our permanent exhibition, Future World Where Art Meets Science. So let's take a, a brief look. So Future World is a partnership with the Japanese art and technology collective Team Lab, whose work you can see here. And with this exhibition, we wanted to make something that was more than an exhibition that you would see in a traditional museum. We wanted to create a world that would change and transform over time, responding to each and every visitor. The show is all about taking nature seriously. It highlights its fragility and both the positive and negative impacts that people have on nature. When we opened Future World four years ago, we showed 100 years C. Here in this piece, Team Lab are visualizing the rising sea levels caused by climate change. The artwork is made based on scientific data from the Worldwide Fund for Nature, or WWF, which predicts the rising of the world's sea levels over a century starting in 2009 and here it's closer to mid 21st century. For us the idea of making the impact of climate change visible and visceral feels important as a museum that's operating in the early part of the 21st century because as the IPCC have been telling us for years climate change is going to transform our way of life within the next two decades. Right now, we are rightly focused on the, price, the crisis of the present day, which of course is the COVID-19 pandemic. But as we manage this, we mustn't forget that in many ways, the pandemic acts as a perfect inflection point to imagine a world where climate change is left unchecked. As, and as the uh, kind of colleague from Oxfam puts it, if that happens, the very foundation of human civilization will be in jeopardy. As a leader, I believe that the emotional connections made possible by art and the understanding generated by science may give us the tools to tackle the systemic problems the world faces. Neither science or art alone is going to be enough, but art and dialogue with science can make a difference. And that was very much the hope behind this collaborative work with the World Wide Fund for Nature and Google, which resulted in an augmented reality rainforest into the wild. Into the wild awakened Art Science Museum's sense of duty to do more for the environment. So to mark the launch of the landmark TV series, Our Planet, we worked with WWF again, again with Google and with Netflix to create a new mixed reality exhibition called Rewild Our Planet. 
these kinds of projects have galvanized our team's sense of environmental responsibility. And so after the pandemic related lockdown in Singapore last year, we reopened the museum with an exhibition that returned to environmental themes. Planet or Plastic was a partnership with National Geographic. And the show told the story of plastic from its invention to the emergence of plastic pollution as a global environmental catastrophe. Visitors learned about Singapore's own issues with plastic, for instance, in this display of plastic items removed from a beach in Singapore just before the show opened. Our beach cleanup activities program during the show got our museum visitors hands-on clearing out plastic pollution on the beaches of Singapore. As well as these practical exhibitions that highlight grave environmental threats, we also use the platform of exhibitions to place our visitors in futures where the world has been transformed by environmental issues. The exhibition 2219, Futures Imagined, explored how our world might change over the next two centuries. The show took the time frame of the Singapore Bicentennial, which is 200 years, and projected it forward to imagine what Singapore, and indeed the world, might be like in the year 2219. Rather than being a set of predictions about how the future may unfold, 2219 presented speculative ideas by more than 30 artists, designers, and architects from around the world. The exhibition placed visitors in scenarios that explored how our future lives might be impacted by climate change and the loss of the planet's biodiversity. It presented unusual narratives about a world radically transformed by a changing environment where different kinds of relationships with the natural world may be needed. It featured experiential futures and interactive artworks that allowed audiences to step into and be part of possible futures. 2219 deliberately resisted the utopian or dystopian futures we often see in science fiction cinema. It instead focused on what we called small futures, intimate and enduring stories and traditions which are passed down from generation to generation. It invited visitors to reflect on what kind of future they want and what actions they might take now to bring that future into being. So as a curator and a leader within this art and tech space, why do I keep returning to environmental futures as a topic? Well, as the director of a museum, I'm starting to understand that an important part of my role is to create meaningful connections between people and their environment. We have the power to inspire wonder and to help our visitors imagine more sustainable futures. Being able to imagine a planet where people and nature coexist more harmoniously is the first step to bringing it into being. So as we all face the global crisis of COVID-19, I think it's important to remember that as leaders working at the intersection of art and technology, we have a role to play in inspiring imagination. By harnessing that imagination, by bringing art, technology and science together, we can create the conditions for a more sustainable future for our communities and for our planet. Thank you. Thank you for the fabulous call to action, Ramon. That was wonderful. I mean, not only were the exhibits um, speaking to this wonderful enterprise that you embarked on, but also um, a, a call to what we might as leaders do, and I think we'll return to that as we come to the discussion. Um, Natalie, may I request you to go next? Sure. Um, okay. Hi, so I'm Natalie and I'm a curator of digital design at the VNA. And for the last decade, I've been a curator who's been looking at the kind of the critical narratives around design, technology, and art and the kind of digital culture. Um, and I wanted to present three projects really today. Kind of one is a kind of my kind of 
part of the museum, one of the projects that I did with the museum and one is around the collection that I look after, um, which is the reason why I work at the museum and one of the things that kind of really inspires me to um, kind of think about the world at large and the way the design and society um, really intersect. So first the project that I want to talk about is um, Haunted Machines and Wicked Problems. So Haunted Machines started in 2014. I work alongside a design, a designer and researcher, Tobias Revel, to kind of manifest this project, which is the best way that I can really describe um, to talk about that. Um, it started with a conference at Future Everything Festival in 2014, um, which 2015, sorry, uh, which is where I eventually became a curator after working for a couple of years at Lighthouse, which is also where I met Anna Harja, who was uh, one of our other kind of conference speakers. Um, who gave me my first arts job, but we'll talk more about that later. Um, so I worked at Future Everything um, during that time, um, but we started the conference as a means to look at the ideas of what, um, why we talk about technology in terms of magic and where this narrativization happened and where essentially it took away some of our agency around the te about, around technology, essentially, and the, and the things it was really doing to us in terms of um, not just surveillance culture, but things like the actual, the, the way that kind of the, entanch, the enchantment, as Alfred Gell calls it, around technology, really had taken away our ability to really unpack and think about um, the, the ability that we had to kind of essentially lay claim to the things that are happening to us from things like uh, the fact that Steve Jobs, um, not Steve Jobs, um, Bill Gates, for instance, in 1984, on the front cover of Time magazine, um, was talking about the floppy disk being this magic item. And so we did a, a, a festival in 2017, many years later, after doing a number of conferences and events to really kind of figure out what this was um, at Impact in 2017. And we did an exhibition. And we talk about one of the exhibitions. There's, no, there's a number of things on our website, uh, hauntedmachines.com, where you can see a whole archive. There's also a library of resources. We publish a lot of writing. Um, by loads of critical thinkers uh, to think about this, um, where we did an exhibition as part of this uh, to really think about uh, multiple issues. Um, and we did one based around the concept of myth, magic and monsters, which is the framework that we've always really thought about. So the mythology is about the origins of technology, particularly the material properties of it and a lot of the kind of more the political implications. So Minira al Qadiri is behind the sun and Deep Float really thinks about the sort of um, the material properties and the economic properties of oil and these two particular pieces are a really beautiful uh, conversation between um, kind of burning of the Kuwaiti oil fields and the economic um, struggles that happened around that time um, and then this beautiful piece by Deep Float which actually was commissioned um, by Ilga um, Mignon um, a few years I think it was a year prior which this particular piece looks at the idea of oil as a magical property and returning it back to the kind of early idea that people used to bathe in it because it had this medicinal and magical properties but also obviously many years later because of the the fight thrill that happened over it, it it became this very violent material and what was the idea of us kind of once essentially it it ceases to have certain uses because of, of the certain races we have um over like the race towards i don't know batteries once batteries kind of become the thing but then we have solar power but then what's next what's nuclear fusion what's Elon Musk's um, future goals but we had the idea of mythologies in the first room then we had magic and again the idea of Arca Girls enchantment we had Orbel of Lazo's piece and um, Sublime Gadget, Gadget Ripple Counter which is the impossible task of trying to count the ripples on the ocean um, which is a, again a magical but impossible task we have James Bridle's activations which is creating a um, open source self-driving car um, but actually it's a beautiful set of photographs which try to kind of like show you what a machine sees which the more that a machine sees the less a human does and it's this beautiful set of photographs that he does of driving around the Greek mountains to do this and then the last um, piece is in my idea of the monstrous um, by Zach Plath which is a facial weaponization suite um, and I love this piece in particular because this um, this mask comes from a set of data sets which um, shows the idea of deviance and sexuality because the idea that um, it comes from a paper, a lot of Zach's work, um, that you could show someone's sexuality purely by facial uh, recognition, which of course is completely preposterous. Um, and he really pulled those premises up, but it showed it, a lot of this work really shows my interest in trying to show the kind of the biases and the, the difficulties in technology and making them present to exhibition and trying to kind of guide audience members through an exhibition to help them slowly uncover them through a narrative as simple as magic. Kishi the Vampire, also by Roy Singh, 
is another person that we kind of brought in. It's like, how do you kind of expand that idea through performance? And we've always found performance to be a really interesting one. So the idea of the, the 20th century notion of economics in Asia and um, through the mysticism of a, of a, um, a uh, the vampiric was always a really interesting, he's, he's one of his kind of closely or so far uh, ancestors that he found this story around. And he was like the idea of vampiric in Asian, um, 20th century Asian economics that he'd created a uh, performance around that we were quite keen to bring into the um, the program. The next pro project that I wanted to talk to you about was one that was we did with the VNA in 2019, which is a, a big difference in magic, but it's um, it's uh, one that was very close to my heart in terms of uh, working with the uh, research unit Forensic Architecture. If you're not familiar with them, they were um, Tenor Prize uh, nominees. Um, they work specifically to work, use technology as a means, um, as a critical means to um, open up a lot of these issues um, around kind of media architecture. How can we use these tools to kind of find, uh, use it as a journalistic technique, essentially. Um, the story behind this exhibition is that in 2014, um, ISIS went to Northern Sinjar and destroyed a great deal of cultural heritage of the Yazidi, um, of Yazidi citizens and Yazidi uh, culture, who are a minority ethnic rec um, um, uh, community um, that have a particular sort of particularly orally transmitted culture. Um, and what is defined in um, particularly as, a, as a form of genocide is the erasure of cultural heritage. And so Forensic architecture um, over the course of a number of uh, months. Um, they work with Yasda, who are a, a charity that kind of made entirely of Yazidi um, survivors. Many of them, unfortunately, were killed um, by ISIS. Um, they work together to use a series of drones and kites and bottled um, bottle rigs. A lot of them are DIY um, methods. Um, which we all exhibited here and showed a number of these things um, and, and the methods in which they use them to pull together photogrammetric um, records essentially and reconstructions in order for them to pull together a case that could be then be shown and trialed to show evidence of cultural dis uh, destruction. Um, and it was, it was key for us to essentially show in um, at exhibitions and like the Milan Triennale, which is often shown to be the very best of design, the ways in which a lot of the tools which are often used, um, things like CAD or photogrammetry or um, Blender or these things that we often use to make chairs, for instance, and the very high traditions of design can be used for tools of protest or for tools of legal recognition or for um, these to get people kind of often closure as well, because also, unfortunately the we can't rebuild these these sites of importance to people, but we cannot we can create a digital record for them as well. And and the, the level of, of sophistication for a lot of these tools means that we can pinpoint details, for instance, um, important um, symbols on the side of them that can identify certain temples, but also can can give you record of who was there and what stories are there, because they are so personal. A lot of these places. Um, it's another kind of example of how a lot of these records are created. And um, so you have, for instance, the ability to go from something as simple as a kite to creating a reconstruction of an entire temple that once, um, that now um, is able to be kind of displayed and shown. Um, and this work is ongoing and it continues to be ongoing. And then the last thing I want to talk to you about is just a collection that I, I look after. So I look after the digital design collection at the VNA, which is a growing collection. Um, I joined in 2017. And we look after anything from 3D printed portraits of Chelsea Manning that were, de that were generated by the DNA from her while she was in prison and by Heather Dewey Hagborg to uh, the first 3D printed gun, which is um, again, a, a real uh, change in uh, objects to um, the 3D printed speculum, which was created by a, um, an activist group uh, called Gani Punk, who worked together essentially to um, create a Tool provocation, um, which is a project that my brilliant research fellow that I wanted to kind of mention, which shows you how a community can generate digital design knowledge around an object, um, ultimately bring into a collection. And I wanted to kind of put this project forward and um, to kind of say you should check it out because it's a brilliant source of, of knowledge that was pulled together for this. So how do you bring a community of, of knowledge together, essentially, to um, generate um, kind of stories around a digital design object and bring that print back into the museum collections? 
We also acquired Kaichi Matsuda's uh, Hyperreality quite recently, which was a real pleasure because it shows, like, for instance, it's very difficult to acquire augmented reality work because of the dish preservation problems that there are around it. But we wanted to also collect critical work around it to show the real impact that it might have on our digital, uh, on our, on society, which is a lot of the, the work that we're quite interested in, in surfacing within the collection because we want to have those collections, we want to have conversations, we want to have those debates within the, within the collection. And something like Kaichi's work, and he is someone who's both an extremely um, interesting thinker, but also has great industrial uh, industry knowledge within this field because he works with uh, Magic Leap and he worked within Microsoft's um, AR team uh, as well. And then I'm out of time. Oh. Out of time. Yes. And that's my, that's my last to slide. Uh, thank you very much. And that's me. Thank you, Lottie. <clears throat> Yeah, so um, Kamya's just warned me that we are running slightly late. So I'll be very brief and I'll share with you a few more. And Rachel too. Oh, good Lord. Oh my God, don't, oh sh shoot. No problem. Do you, do you want to go ahead and go next? No, no, I just completely forgot. Okay. I'll just, I'll just try to also go quickly. I'm drugged. So I, I have a cold and I'm drugged. That's my excuse tonight. So many <laughs> apologies. Rachel goes next. And um, yes, please, Rachel. Okay. So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Rachel Uwa, and I'm originally from Texas, but I've been living in Berlin, Germany for 17 years. Before I start talking about the school, I just wanted to mention, so I do have a background in audio engineering and visual effects. And when I was working in both of those fields, um, over different periods of time, obviously, there were almost no women working in these fields. And so, um, and so I remember, for example, um, creating the Women in Audio group and putting a newspaper ad in the like Chicago paper, looking for other people interested. And so I just wanted to say that because uh, we've come a long way, definitely, but there's still a lot of work to do. And also, if you are looking for something like a community and you don't see it, then you should look to create it yourself. And also um, like community and support group is, is just like such an important part of making it through this world because it's really complicated. So just to encourage people to think about those kinds of things. Um, and yeah, so about the School of Machines. So I started School of Machines Making and Make Believe in 2014. And uh, I think it was also because I was looking for educational opportunities that I wasn't seeing in the world. So um, with School of Machines, I've been running four week full-time programs up until COVID. Um, and, and the idea was to get pe bring people together to think about who they are and what they care about and to question technology, how it's being used both for us and against us and to, um, yeah, just kind of think of what better worlds might look like. And, um, and then in, in the end of each program, we have a final showcase. So in the last week, everybody's creating a work for um, exhibition. And uh, so, yeah, I just, I'll go through some images. Um, I'm, I, I'm not gonna talk specifically about most projects because I've done several talks and you can probably find them online where I talk a little bit more about the projects, but at such limited time, I just wanted to be quick. So some topics we have covered, we started off um, with computer, um, sorry, with Creative coding and physical computing were the first two classes I ran, and here are some of the works. We also in the class did like projection mapping and um, riding around on bikes and projecting on wa on on walls and interacting with the public. Um, we have done speculative design, critical design, um, digital fabrication classes, um, data art, data visualization. Um, virtual reality, um, machine learning. Actually in this, oh, sorry, I don't know if you see, sorry <laughs> to move everybody. Uh, this project here on the, oh, sorry, on the right, it was, it was done by a woman that we had um, as a student from India. And she was talking about how in the metros in Delhi, there are just so many people and, and you constantly are being groped and grabbed by people. And so she wanted to make something to kind of show uh, that experience. And so in this thing, it's like uh, you have a connect looking at you and then you're swatting away these hands. And I thought like, I mean, it's just a perfect example of um, how I encourage people to create something that reflects who they are and what they care about and what's going on in the world as they see it. Um, also, we have done pro programs on um, binaural sound and um, 
LARPing, creative machine learning. We've also done programs in other countries, in Belgrade, Serbia, and in uh, China, and Ireland, and Italy. Uh, also immersive sound stuff. Um, and yeah, I guess, so main thing is, you know, when we're thinking about like what we want to create, I think I encourage people to think about what is the experience that you want to create. And using experiences to connect with other humans, I think is the most important part of what technology can give us. Um, and also, so, you know, like, because in the, in the promotion for this program, I, I noticed like Kam Kamya had posted um, the idea that if you, you need to see someone that looks like you in order to know that you can do this thing too. And so in the same kind of way, I think that we need to create new experiences and show people that new experience, like, like there are new experiences to create in the world, to show them that the world we see in front of us isn't the world that it needs to be. It's just the world that it is now, but we can also um, show a new way. And so this is, I think, a really important aspect of the message that I'm trying to get across. Uh, and so, you know, also too, for example, like, you know, when I think about STEM and STEAM, I'm thinking like the difference is that with STEM, someone tells you to build a rocket and you can build it for them. Whereas with STEAM, you can imagine the kind of rocket that you want to create and then, you know, find a way to create that. So it's like, I feel like art, it belongs with technology. It, it's like the dreaming part and the critical part. And I think that they should always go together hand in hand. So I have um, other things I wanted to say, and I just wrote them in text form, and I'm just gonna read them out, uh, th thoughts I wanted to leave everybody with. So the strength of a community is in the individuals that make it up. If you as individuals are whole, your community will be whole too. Technology is cool, but more importantly, who are you and what do you care about? We can't possibly know everything there is to know in the world, so ask, never be too shy to ask. And even if you feel too shy, ask anyway. Don't aim to be impressive, aim to be real. Everyone feels self-doubt. Don't give these thoughts weight, they will pass. Just keep moving forward. Look inside when you're wanting to figure out what to create, you know, look inside you, what matters to you, create that. Learn to communicate what you need, how you feel, what is uncomfortable, what can be better. Technology is relatively easy to work with. Focus on feeling good about being alive. Self-confidence is more than half the battle to learning anything. Don't fall into the trap of it's already been done. Do your version anyway. There is no space for ego, be humble. I mean this sincerely. And you know, we, all, we think we treat people well, but like treat people better. And how do you know how to treat people better? Treat yourself better and then you know how to treat others. Question everything, question capitalism, question caste system, question racism, colorism, all the things. Create things that answer questions you're curious about. Create things that make people think. Our goal on earth should not be to be the best, that's a moving target. Our goal should be to evolve our understanding of what it is to be alive. You have more power than you realize to expose unknown truths and be a positive light in the lives of others through your work. Let's create and experience magic before we die. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, apologies again for uh, having missed you. Uh, that, was a, that was wonderful. Um, let me quickly take the opportunity to also share with you the work that I have been doing now for nearly four years. Um, and uh, following which we will enter a discussion. And let me see if my screen will share itself. Yes, it is. Here we go. So <clears throat> very quickly, uh, I am leading the establishment of Science Gallery Bengaluru, which is a part of an international network of galleries. We have five in Europe, two in the United States, one in Australia, and one in India, in Bangalore, where I am. We work um, closely with the government. We are, we are the only autonomous gallery within the network, and we work very closely with three academic institutions. 
If you ask me what our motto is, it's science, culture, and experiment. And um, of course, as we, you know, uh, as we proceed, uh, you will probably realize there's a lot that's folded into this. Artistic expression, in a way, gets folded into culture, and and of course, also work with new technologies or emerging technologies gets folded into both experiment and science. Uh, so here's what we are doing. Um, the 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 public engagement is common to all of us eight galleries across the world. Uh, the public lab complex is unique to the Bangalore location. We have uh, mentorship initiatives and community initiatives about which I'm happy to discuss later. So this is just a lovely expression of our science culture experiment uh, thing. It's cute, it doesn't have a deeper meaning. I mean, science culture experiment does, but that particular poster doesn't. Uh, we are four exhibitions old, so we are a new kid on the block. Uh, the first two of these elements in Submerge were uh, physical, the next two, Phytopia and Contagion, were online. Um, and I think it's uh, during the making of Phytopia and Contagion that we, in a way, confronted the question of technology, not uh, merely in, well, no, sorry, there's no merely, uh, not only in the works that we showcase, but also in our own use of it in order to reach different audiences and to create different kinds of experiences. So we work with partners both across the world, but also in the city and in the country uh, elements. Um, so the archives of all our exhibitions are online contagions, in fact, closing only on December 31st. So if you have a moment, do please drop by. Uh, you will see our growth and the development of what we are calling uh, living exhibitions. That's an idea that we are playing with. Um, belongs to the family of living museums and living archives. Uh, so elements, this is submerged sort of we grew in the number of exhibits, but also the kind of programming we did um, kind of stabilized here. And then with Contagion, we went bonkers. So here's where we are. Um, that's our building when it opens, hopefully end of next year. Thanks for listening and we can move on to the questions. So as promised, I was brief, but I'm happy to take questions later. So coming to the panel for today, um, it is, Fabulous to have the opportunity to be in the room, Zoom as it may be, uh, with uh, women who are leading um, efforts in the art science, art tech, tech art space um, in very different ways, right? So if we look at Julia, she's working in a university. If you look at Honor, she is leading um, a very large enterprise. Uh, which is a company, if I'm not mistaken, um, and um, it's 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 a it's a corporate enterprise. Uh, Natalie working within a cultural institution, and Rachel has set up her own institution. And each of those are very good settings to explore because these are the settings in which you know this practice is conducted. And so, what the the first question I'm going to pose to my uh, four co panelists is to say, might you? share with us the one specific challenge that comes with working in the location that you work at. So uh, but we, maybe we reverse the order now and uh, start with Rachel first. What does it mean to set up something, you know, on your own? And what, what, is, what is that challenge that, you know, uh, that you've confronted that you're willing to share with us today? I think the challenge is about, um, I feel like, I don't know, like, like the, you know, because a lot of people get funding and, and also like the education system is very different here. And, um, and so I think people are just not used to paying for education. And at the same time, um, I find funding a really difficult thing to grasp, you know, it's like, I'm like, what, what do you want from me? I'll show you that thing. I, I really don't know what they're looking for. So, um, so I think, yeah, that is, that is a challenge because, you know, you want to create something in the world and everybody's like, okay, I, I want to do something, but I need a developer or I need money. And mm. I think the way to do it without those things, but you just have to be willing to sacrifice comfort and a lot of things that other people might more easily access. Okay. Um, so funding, funding is, a, or, or the, 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 how should I say, the ability to grasp that culture costs um, cost resources to, to make and it doesn't sort of happen for free is, is, is missing in our under, collective understanding. Natalie, what would be your challenge working within a cultural institution? 
Um, oh, it's a good question. Um, museums have a reputation, um, and a lot of it comes from. I mean, I'm going to be. I'm going to be. I'll, I'll be frank and be honest because I think it's really important. I am um, that museums come from a history and a legacy of um, of colonialism, and come from a legacy legacy of um, not serving. Mm. The best audiences and in, in and of in terms of where they come from and who is in them and who has previously had access to them and how the culture is kind of filled so like they are very white and they're very kind of educated from a certain part of kind of the world and that kind of thing and they need to change and in terms of like how the um the, the artists that we work with and the artists that I want to kind of and the designers I want to work with and bring in we we try to have those conversations and we try to kind of like bridge that in some ways but obviously it's it's something that we do need to confront and think about and also the kind of the act basically access and like and it's it's, it's both for the audiences it's with the kind of collections we do it's it's all a number of things um and it, it also there's like access for audiences and then there's access for like the more technical side for me which is like digital access like it's very hard for me to preserve and work with the material that I work with which because it's 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 like it's disappearing at an alarming rate mm. but for me for me personally the thing that I really am concerned with is just like how we make sure that we think about um who who and, and, and who is who we really want to engage with in the long term yep. um Legacy, concerns of legacy, concerns yeah, of legacy. Of, uh, yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's uh, I mean, you know, even in administration, one deals with sort of legacy issues of, of you know, uh, uh, prior leaders of institutions. And of course, I mean, here there are histories and, and very, very deep and wounded histories that one needs to address. So that that is indeed a, a very, very important challenge. Oh, no, what would be yours? Because you work in a very, very specific kind of setting, right? Uh, I mean, right now, if you're talking about challenges, it's really hard to go past the pandemic. Yeah, it's it's just profound, you know. It's for for the museum sector globally, it's just completely changed the way that we work. And well, there's been some positives that have that have come out of it for sure. In terms of, I think a deeper um, sensitivity to local context, uh, mm -hmm. a deeper understanding of inequities that already existed that the pandemic has massively amplified. Um, the practical challenges of running an institution through a pandemic are, are quite profound. Um, you know, we're an institution that was that was built and um, and and tasked with the, the the duty of of having a kind of a global outlook. You know, mm. kind of within the city state of Singapore, and when the globe, you know, kind of uh, sort of mainly consists right now of Zoom calls as opposed to true connectivity, where we can bring you know, scientists, artists, engineers, and architects from around the world and send our projects into the world. Um, it, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to carve out a kind of a new identity for a start, you know, kind of when your, uh, your, your museum is suddenly only addressing a local mm. context, mm. Um, but also a, a new way of being able to um, conduct business because all of us, you know, whether we're working in public institutions, educational establishments, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, historical museums, contemporary museums, we all run businesses, basically, and um, whoever pays the bills, uh, kind of, um, uh, you know, kind of, we need to, you know, sort of earn, earn money, and the pandemic has made that profoundly uh, kind of difficult. So, yeah, I think that, that is, it's, it's hard for me to go beyond that challenge right now. Um, mm. It's also been a very useful way of I think, you know, kind of learning how, um, how important, you know, kind of our, our teams are. Um, that's that the pandemic's really highlighted, you know, how precious mm. uh, the people that we work with are and how their labor and their um, passion and commitment um, kind of are really the things which define institutions. Um, it's not necessarily our collections or our buildings, it's the people. Um, and certainly, I think we've put a, a great focus uh, kind of with an art science museum on really trying to highlight that and, um, and lean into the team being, you know, kind of the, 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 the real tissue, the fabric uh, kind of that make up the institution. Thank you. Thank you, Honor. Yes, um, I think these have been some, some very, very heavy questions that many institutions have had to deal with. And not all of us made it out of that tunnel. 
um, some of us have, and uh, it, it it is it is very sobering to stand here and and we haven't even quite seen the end yet, um, and and where things might go. Julia, you're you're in a university setting, you know something I'm familiar with and and have sort of you know distanced myself from for the last four years, but I I'm sure that it comes with its own set of challenges. What would you say has been your biggest challenge so far? I would say that uh, this is also my, uh, let's say, experience at the FF. Um It's basically a technical university. Yeah. So the site, we are here talking about art science. Uh, so the, the big thing when I arrived at the FFL, I, I, I think I really felt, okay, here we need to make space for contemporary art. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was actually the other way around. Uh, so in the sense that, uh, perhaps uh, it's so much the science and technology oriented that actually contemporary art or art or artistic reflections is what we are bringing. So for instance, also nature of robotics was not necessarily a, an exhibition I would consider possible when I arrived at the EPFL where let's say art or artistic practices or artists do not have, wouldn't have a role there. So I have to say that the, the real very concrete challenge that I know we are talking here about art science, but for us, what I, was actually to build an art science institution within the framework of the EPFL. And afterwards, of course, I feel also honored that, I mean, this anyway, pandemics is constantly uh, a bit reframing also, I mean, in terms of programs, very concretely, this uh, sort of uh, need of re, um, re um, planning constantly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And just to conclude also, I think in this specific setting of a technical and scientific university is also a permanent negotiation of these courses. Mm. And this is what also I felt more than in a truly art institutions or art science institutions. Here we are in a specific setting in which, let's say, we need to, to use a specific language to uh, mediate contents that are in this sense. I mean, why, the reason why I, I think uh, uh, contemporary art and artistic practices are always the, the let's say, the fundamental field. It's basically, we are free. There's mm -hmm. a freedom of articulating discourses. And yes. uh, I would say that in a purely scientific and technological setting, you need to actually negotiate discourses more. Yep, no, I think that that's that's very right. And, and, and uh, that's also, some, I mean, that's also something I find myself balancing being experienced from, uh, you know, uh, coming from academia for over two decades into yeah. some, into a very different setting and how in many ways, um, you know, the assumptions around what one can say and not say, even in a managerial role uh, in either of the locations is actually quite different. And, and I think uh, uh, that that for me was a sobering lesson. So, you know, we, we, we're going to at some point go into breakout rooms, but uh, Kamya, if I may, I wanted to just ask one question to each of our panelists, because uh, we will get the chance to be with, with uh, one or two of, of our panelists in a room, but I, I thought it would be quite nice to just get a sense of each of our journeys in, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, how we got to where we are, right? Like, we, I mean, you, 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 we're all, we're all, uh, uh, I think more or less female by gender, and we, you know, are leading in leading roles in different ways. And uh, you know, uh, something that Kamya said at the start: what you what you don't see, you don't imagine. And so, you know, what so while the imagination of the role is now, in a sense, evident to uh, you know our audience, but also to you know many of our younger colleagues and and you know people around us. I think it would be wonderful to know what went into making that journey, right? Like to, to arrive at a role uh, of this kind, because, because it's also a niche space. It's not exactly something self-evident, right? Like, and, and, and I think that's what makes it unique. So why don't we start, if I may, with Julia now and say, uh, oh, oh, yeah, if, if you're okay with it, to just give us a very, very quickly, a sense of how you, how you arrived at where you are, in a sense, you know, what you studied, but also, what, how you might have actually, you know, gotten away from that and then did something else, and you know, uh, so uh, briefly, but in a in a way such that our our uh, audience today just gets a sense of what that journey looked like. It's I start right. Yes, please. Okay, yeah. And now I have to say, for me, I I want to. It's a permanent exploration, and it was an exploration since the beginning. So I was basically. Um, 
an art historian in Rome, and it was clear for me that I wanted to explore directions in experimental directions, and I had to just follow these directions. And therefore, I went first to Venice, and then I went to uh, Germany, of course, in the meantime, also uh, London, Paris, so many in a European Western <laughs> framework. But basically, I just uh, followed the need of uh, discovering and keeping up, keeping up on contemporary discourses. And for this reason, it was fundamental to move. Just I want to uh, just comment on a, on a comment that we have on, um, on the chat. It's true. I also think that the pandemic disclosed also possibilities that we couldn't imagine before in terms of access, which are actually also potentially very interesting. Probably we, we all felt the, 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 the fact that uh, at some point things that were not reachable before are actually reachable intellectuals that we would love mm -hmm. to follow or so that's that's just a comment. But personally, uh, in my case, it was really just following and permanently, actually, I, I continue in this exploration still uh, now. And uh, I sort of feel that every, every time is uh, just a step on, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, the need of discovering experimental ways. Wonderful. I think, I think that would probably resonate with almost all of us. Honor, could you say a few words yourself? I, I started as a volunteer. And um, and I uh, that, that's how I started. And, um, and in fact, many of the people who uh, kind of I've mentored uh, kind of over the years started as volunteers. And when I say volunteers, I should also make a distinction. I'm not talking about unpaid internships. Um, you know, I'm talking about getting involved in your local community. Uh, in my case, it was my local uh, radio station uh, that was focused on uh, independent and experimental music and then my local art gallery and getting involved and asking them if they needed help and, and helping out how I could uh, kind of around my, you know, sort of part-time jobs when I was at school uh, and my part-time jobs when I was in university. So there's, you know, the, 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 the best way to get into this sector is to, is, to, is to just do it, just get on with it. And um, if that means volunteering and giving a little bit of your spare time, whilst we fully acknowledge that's precious and, um, and not everyone has uh, kind of spare time, um, uh, you know. Kind of th that's that's how to get how to get involved. And you know, one of the things that I've I've reflected on quite um, quite a lot when uh, you know when I've been engaged in in hiring is um, is you know what I'm now looking for in um, in, in employees and colleagues and and, and partners, and uh, and I'm deeply disinterested. Um, profoundly disinterested in where someone's gone to school and um, mm. and what kind of degree they have it just doesn't it's not relevant you know kind of to me what I want to see is what they've what they've done yeah. um, and that might be that they've run a really fantastic blog and so therefore I can see their you know writing skills or they have an awesome Instagram account so I can see that you know kind of they, they know how to do photography um, uh, and, and curate, you know, kind of, or it might be that they've, you know, kind of uh, volunteered in their local elder care home, so I can see that they have a, a conscience. But that, yep. that, you know, kind of that desire to actually get involved and 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 do something and make a contribution, I think that's the that's that that's how I started, and I, I think that's probably how many of us started. Thank you. Thank you, Honor. I think that that's important and addresses one of the questions also that came in and briefly, you know, if we are about equity and access, how, how does one deal with the fact that this might be an inner, uh, this might be uh, an elitist space, but we'll come back to that question in a bit. Natalie, would you like to share a little bit about your journey, please? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll try and be brief. Um, yes, please. I, I came from a slightly sort of like roundabout bit. Um, I didn't study art at all. I, I, um, I was the first in my family anyway to go to university because my family like builders and stuff and they were like yeah art's rubbish don't really know why you want to do that um so I, I did literature I did English literature and I did dissertation about stalking which is funny um and then I went to go and do a master's couldn't afford it so I was a cleaner and worked in a call center for like a bit while also like volunteering at art galleries because mm -hmm. I was just like I like this this is good people are really nice here and then someone said oh okay like Lighthouse has got some volunteer spots do you want to go and hang out with them they do art and tech stuff and that's where I met Honor actually and like kind of she was floating around being smart 
Um, and then I was like, oh, maybe I want to like this art and tech stuff cool, learn how to code while I was kind of figuring out this coding stuff. So everyone was like, learn how to code, code is cool. Um, and so I learned how to code, but also I had this really good kind of critical backing of being in a space where like they were like, oh yeah, learning how to code is not it. You have to like also have this critical stuff as well. So I did that. And then that's how I kind of got into it. But I've always been um, interested in um, kind of doing lots of stuff. So I was also writing a blog about all the art I saw as well. And so all the events I went to, I blogged about and I was always just like, and also like Twitter. Do you remember when Twitter wasn't completely a hell site? I also like was on Twitter a bit as well. Um, I mean, maybe it always was terrible. And I was just like, I had just like some nice friends. Um, but I was always quite like, trying to figure out what everyone else is really excited about all the time um so that's that's the kind of thing that I've always tried to encourage people um about is try to like find a community but I also think that's really difficult now um because there are lots of places which are not so great um but just to kind of go to the point that the question person asked about it being kind of elitist yeah museums are well elitist I mean like it's it's that they 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 come they're, they're but they are kind of a hodgepodge but one of the things that I do find quite encouraging is that there are there are people kind of coming through it, but, but you just, it's find it's making that space where you can find the pockets and hang on to them. So people don't kind of get burnt out when they get here. That's a, that's a really difficult part because there are, it's, it's not the pipeline problem because there are loads of really, really, I mean, it's both the pipeline problem with people. There are loads of really smart, like kind of like cool, queer, like PSC disabled people who are coming through, but they just get burnt out because there's never support structures for them. That's the problem. That's sorry, this is another conversation, but that's yeah, the thing. We'll come, so. we come back to that um, uh, again because I think it's an important question. Uh, Rachel. Uh, yeah, I would just be brief. So I was working in visual effects um, and I started to, well, I started to work way too many hours and I hated it. And um, I remember I was working on one project and I was like, I want to die, but like, it was like in the middle of the night and it was like this project that had to be done in the morning anyway, but I was like, there's no way to die. There's not even buses running in this town. And like, so it's like, okay, I just have to do it. And then anyway, I, I started to realize that the things that we could see in films, like the visual effects and things that were happening <clears> you <throat> that in the real world, like with interactivity, with coding, with like electronics and things. So I thought I would rather focus on that. So I kind of left it for the creative tech world. Okay, so interesting journeys really from, from not only different fields, but also different practices. So volunteering to doing lots of work and volunteering to art, to visual effects. And in my case, it's history of science and academia, which I sort of, you know, kind of uh, left behind to do this work now. So, well, I don't quite know if I've left it behind. It keeps popping its head. Uh, off and on and uh, makes me want to do things. So uh, Kamya, how do we proceed? Uh, uh, should we uh, take the questions one by one or how are we going to do this? Go ahead. Sure, we have 15 minutes left in the here. Yeah. Before we go out into smaller rooms. Um, there are questions popping in the chat. I can pull them up um, from before. But Honor, it looks like you want to answer Gautam's question. And Gautam, feel free to unmute yourself and maybe ask it even. Is he there? Yeah, I'm right here. I, oh, yeah. I, Wonderful. Maybe I won't ask it since uh, I, I put it in the honor has actually responded as well. So uh, no, uh, I'm a general conversation. Are not elitist. I was wondering if that's one of the challenges amongst all the others that you mentioned. If that's one of the challenges that you face, because all of you uh, are attempting to make it uh, more accessible, uh, and um, because I, as I was watched, as I was looking at some of the works, especially Julia's, and uh, you know things that involved a lot more tech and a lot more, um, I suppose, resources to create. Uh, I was uh, I was wondering, uh, you know, how many of us could actually. Uh, break into that, as Natalie said, uh, which is not to suggest that you you know you should not uh, also be participating in in uh, an art form of that kind. It's exciting. It's really exciting to see some of those works. Uh, but I was just wondering if that's a challenge that you all have taken up. So indeed, in in Bangalore, uh, we did sort of you know especially when we went online um, uh, during the during the pandemic. That was in fact the first challenge we confronted, right? 
So, uh, and we realized that even before making our exhibitions and, you know, doing sort of the work that we're supposed to do, uh, we did a few training sessions for young adults who were working in uh, disenfranchised neighborhoods. And that's when we realized that there were five young people sharing one telephone, right? Uh, sorry, uh, one mobile phone. And so it was very clear that, you know, we, we couldn't design online exhibitions that were meant for fancy desktops and, you know, no gimmicks, no AR, no VR. Uh, in fact, the, we couldn't even bank on reliable internet connections, right? In many cases, or on smartphones. And so there were so many decisions that we took. So, you know, we, we focused on the quality of the content, of course, and, and, you know, we didn't kind of compromise on that. But what we... What we did when we when we built the website uh, that hosted the exhibition was to ensure that it would load with as minimum bandwidth as possible, for example, um, and try to not have uh, extremely uh, you know high tech requirements like um, uh, you know apps for AR VR experiences or glasses or headphones or, or those kinds of things. Uh, now, of course. Uh, the experience would be much, you know, would be very different if we were able to do that. And, you know, it, but we would probably prove nothing more than the fact that we are able to do it. We would have lost many of our audiences. And, and quite, quite frankly, at the end of the day, we found out that we didn't even lose many of our audiences, uh, audiences who could have actually, you know, had these devices because we had young people in the United States, in Nigeria, in Tokyo, staying up at odd hours to attend our workshops and, you know, uh, uh, also visit the website, uh, the exhibition website, etc. So, yes, it's something most certainly we have confronted in Bangalore and we are doing our best to work around it, both when we do physical exhibitions, but also when we do online experiences. Yeah. And uh, just to uh, add to Rachel's point, I, I agree with you in, in many of the conferences, I, I mean, many other uh, kinds of art also, you, you know, you see the same kind of people. So uh, it's not only the kind of art that, that, that is restrictive. Uh, so that's true. May I also add the comment? Because of course, I think there is a, there is a truth, um, even if, I would say that, I mean, artists and the language of art, actually the main aim is communication. Of course, this is question of accessing means and technologies is a point. And I mean, um, in, the, in the case of IPF Pavilions is located in Switzerland is for surely a specific context in turn also technical university, it's clear. The aim of the artists in residence program in this sense, it's actually to allow really artists to access also reality that don't necessarily know about. That's also this thing, because opening up a program, there's also this idea of allowing this, this access. And then uh, elitism, let's say, okay, assuming the fact that we are clearly conscious of being based in Switzerland, in Lausanne, at the Swiss Federal Institute for Technology, the exhibition actually really aim to, in, the, in some senses, even in terms of discourse, I would say the aim for us is sometimes even to not to simplify, but really to make, to make it accessible, both the artistic and the technological one, because there's also this point. For us, it's also a space for entering, let's say science that sometimes it's also a super elitist context, because usually you don't access really a science. It's really on, on a planet, which is even beyond uh, the one of um, contemporary art, I would say, or, or artistic practices in terms of accessibility. So I think perhaps we should uh, address this question of elitism, both in the sense, of course, there's a sense of technologies and what it's, what they imply, that's clear, but also, I mean, in what senses you transmit both um, scientific and technological discourses, what are the discourses, and also basically in this sense, we are really open to a broad community, as long as it's this community also wants to cross uh, Lausanne and come to the UPFL, which is indeed a bit outside, peripheral in the city. So. I think we all have different challenges in turn in this sense. And I, I just wanted to add a point about that sort of accessibility and particularly sort of the kind of digital audiences that do exist. Because one of the things that was quite interesting that happened during the pandemic was the rise in these digital and kind of hybrid events that actually reached out and enabled many audiences that kind of previously been asking for these hybrid events, particularly chronically ill and disabled audiences who previously weren't able to come to our events and hadn't kind of also been asking for provision to these events for a long time and had always, always been told, this is too complicated, this is not a kind of able. And suddenly out of nowhere, we were like, oh, we can enable these things. And we have to be mindful that we don't lose this, but also that we design events that are not just either kind of 
run replications or a, a substandard version of these of these things that actually seems to complement or a good a good kind of good thing that kind of exists alongside our, our, the next kind of era of programming that we enable and also our, our brought in with accessibility as well um, in mind so it's, it's things like kind of allowing for um, captioning but also allowing for things like them just to be kind of enjoyable events they're not just like a, oh we have to add this on because it's just a thing we have to do for disabled people because I appreciate it when I'm having like a flare-up that I can go to an event which is just as good as the one that's in person. Great. Um, we are a couple of minutes away from opening up our breakout rooms. So let the conversation not stop, but just get a lot more deeper. Um, I wanted to just really quickly say that I have to ta thank our supporters. I missed that slide out. And so I'm really, really sorry. Um, we have had some really amazing supporters and partners through this project. Um, and I think I'm going to give it a moment right now to say thank you, Pro Helvetia, New Delhi, and things are still starting up. Sorry about that. Thank you, Goethe Institute, uh, Bangalore. Oh man, sorry. Um, thank you, British Council, and um, thank you to the US Embassy in Singapore and for the dialogue series, the embassy of Switzerland and Singapore as well. So these folks have really come on board and put their faith and trust in us. And oops, again, I go wrong. And um, yeah, and we also had partners, ThoughtWorks Arts, In the Wild, Supernormal, uh, our communication partner, Dara, and Artahack. So, Quick plug in there to say absolute thanks. This is our last public big dialogue. Our dialogues should continue, will continue. The community has come together and everybody, we do have a presence in Dara for everybody who's in the meeting right now. You've been put into a little Dara group, which is a communication platform. Please keep these conversations going a little bit further even in that group as we go ahead. But for now, we will kind of break in to smaller groups. Um, for our guests here, we will have um, Julia and Honor in room one, Navya. Correct. And Rachel and Janvi in room two. And Natalie, and I'm going to keep Natalie company. So folks who want to talk to Natalie and me, come over to the room three. Of course, you can feel 